This took place when I was in my early 20s. It was the year 2003, and I was a taxi driver at the time. That was a job I did for several years while I was finishing my education. I worked the late shift mostly, since it was the only way I could fit with my schedule. After dropping off my last passenger, I started to head home. There was a new housing development on my route. I had passed through it a few times before. You could tell by the size of the unfinished houses that some serious money went into this place. During the day, the place was hopping with construction workers and landscapers, but it was nearly 2 a.m., and all that remained were piles of lumber and lifeless machinery. Excavators, bulldozers, and the like. The neighborhood backed onto a forest, another sign that it was an upper-class development. I had an eerie feeling as I slowly made my way through the construction site. There was a sign saying, slow for workers. I didn't know if it applied in the middle of the night, but I couldn't risk a ticket, so I followed it anyway. As I passed a large dump truck, my headlights illuminated the shape of a man. I didn't have time to react before he ran up to my window. Terrified, I quickly locked my doors and made sure all of my windows were up. As he neared the driver's side window, I could tell he was a clean-cut guy, probably in his mid-forties. He wore a flannel shirt with blue jeans and tennis shoes. He looked just like a normal guy. Normal apart from the fact that he was absolutely terrified. Tears rolling down his face, his whole body was shaking. He stood next to my car. His muffled words were unintelligible through my closed windows. Perhaps I should have driven away, but for some reason I decided to hear him out. I opened my window just enough so I could hear him. Please, sir. Please. Let me in. I have money, he pleaded. Um, is there someone I can call for you? I offered. There's no time. He's coming, the man begged. What's coming? I asked confusedly. Sir, please, there's no time to explain, he cried. I was more than a little scared at this point. Part of me wanted to help him, but we were so alone out there, and his eagerness to get into the car had me worried. Most taxi drivers have a story to tell about a passenger who they shouldn't have picked up. It's an unfortunate part of the job, but assaults do happen. I reluctantly decided not to let him in. Hold on, I'll call the police for you, I told him. No, there's no time. Please. As I drove away, I could hear him shouting please while he ran after my car. My heart was divided as I listened to him cry. I drove straight to the police station and told them what happened. They told me to go home and that they would send someone to look for him. I did what they said. After a sleepless night, I called the police station to check if he was found. They told me that they sent two patrol cars to the spot where I saw him, but nothing was found. I was somewhat relieved, hoping that either he found another ride, or perhaps my suspicions were right and he had bad intentions. A few days later, I was watching the news. There was a report of a body found in the forest near the spot where I met the man. They showed a picture of the victim, and it was him, the man who had begged for my help that night. The reporter said the cause of death was an animal attack, but I don't believe it. There were no animals in that forest larger than a raccoon. Also, I distinctly remember the man saying, he's chasing me. If it were an animal, he would have said that. It was difficult for me to deal with the guilt I felt for turning my back on a person in need. I do believe that a lot of people would be sympathetic to the decision I made that night, but it's still hard. So many questions remain unanswered though. Who was he running from? Why was he being chased? And most terrifying of all, whatever it was, is it still out there? This is a true story of mine that took place back in September 2020. I was on a trip to Germany where most of my family and friends live aside from those who are in the state of California. Not to flex, but my family is extremely rich. I mean, way richer than I'm able to portray. In fact, my uncle is a billionaire as of this date. Therefore, I had my own personal supercar, which was a 2020 Lamborghini Aventator SV in Germany. 
I have my own back in the US too. My cousins, who also had a ghastly amount of money, were in Germany at that time as well. We decided to take a stroll on the German Autobahn with our supercars. For those of you who don't know, the Autobahn is a highway in Germany with no speed limit. The cruise consisted of me and my cousins David, Luke, and Werner. David had a Ferrari SF90, Luke was going to take his Porsche 918, and Werner was in his McLaren 720S. We began our ride at 8pm. Before we knew it, we were going just north of 260 kilometers per hour. I was having fun when I noticed something was wrong with David, and he was missing from the team. I looked around to make sure I wasn't mistaken, but to my horror, I wasn't. David was actually missing. I called my other cousins and told them to pull over. When I told them what happened, they were just as perplexed and horrified as I was, because there's no way David could have gone missing abruptly at 250 kilometers per hour. I tried calling him, but he wasn't picking up. We did something next that we could probably get a ticket for. We turned our cars around and went the opposite direction on the road in order to look for David. When we got to the part of the road where David had last been seen, we decided to park our cars and go look for him in the woods next to the long autobahn. Not even three minutes later, I could hear cries for help. It was David's voice. We ran in the direction where the voice was coming from, only to realize something that to this day makes my skin turn cold. Every time we ran, the cries for help would be the same distance away, like David or whatever was pretending to be David, was moving away from us while crying for help. We started panicking and crying in frustration. We looked and looked, but couldn't find him. With tears in our eyes, we called Luke's parents, who were just as terror-stricken as we were. They called the police for us, and we waited until they arrived. A huge search party was organized. It went on for three days until David's Ferrari was found. What was peculiar, though, was the fact that the car showed no sign of being part of an incident, meaning it was completely fine, not a scratch on it to be found, and nothing was missing from inside, except David. The search party continued, but to no avail, for a solid year. This caused the case to be shut down, because no one could make out how this could happen, except if it were a glitch in the Matrix or something. It's 2022, and I still miss and cry for my dear cousin. His car has been returned to us, and I drive it around sometimes. I still hope for some reason that he's okay, or at least alive, and can be found. This incident has chilled every bone in my body. As unbelievable as it sounds, it is true, yet extremely puzzling. A few years ago, I was driving home from a friend's place. I lived out in the country, so I would often drive to town to hang out with friends. I don't remember exactly what we were doing this evening, but we would often go bowling, see a movie, or just grab an ice cream and hang out in the park. I do remember, however, that we'd lost track of time, and it was after midnight by the time I started to drive home. My house was about five miles from the highway. That's five miles of unlit dirt roads so at night it can be a little spooky. It is amazing how dark it actually gets. So dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face if the lights go out. Because of that, I always take this drive slowly in the dark because you can only see about 15 or 20 feet ahead. Therefore, if you need to stop for a deer or avoid a pothole, it helps to have that extra time. Not a lot of people live out there. That's why I was surprised to see a man walking along the side of the road. I was about half a mile from the highway at that point. My headlights illuminated his body as he stood there waving at me, with a friendly smile on his face. He was a larger man, tall and burly, with a mustache and old baseball hat. If I had to guess, I'd say he was in his late thirties. I know that alarm bells should have been going off in my head, but he really didn't seem threatening. Also, living in the country, people tend to help each other out, so maybe that's why I was so trusting. I slowed my car and he approached the driver's side window as I came to a stop. Howdy ma'am, I'm so sorry to bother you, but could I trouble you for a ride into town? He said. I didn't even hesitate and agreed. Sure, hop in, 
I said. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. I'm Ricky, he said graciously. Well, you're welcome, Ricky. I'm Sheila, I replied. Naive as it sounds, he was just so polite that I couldn't help but trust him. I turned the car around and headed back to the highway. Like I said, we were only half a mile in at this point, so it was not a huge problem to give him a ride. We made small talk for several minutes. His calm demeanor made me feel at ease, even though I was alone in a car with a stranger. After not more than ten minutes, however, he said, I'm terribly sorry to have to do this, ma'am, but I'm going to need to take your car. I had to pause to take in what I was hearing. What are you talking about? I pleaded. Like I said, I need to take the car. Let's not make this difficult, he said. I sat there, stunned in disbelief. I was about to give him a piece of my mind when he pulled out a handgun and pointed it right at me. My heart nearly stopped when I looked at him. A look of sorrow was on his face, like he genuinely felt bad for what he was doing. I brought the car to a stop and got out. Ricky took the driver's seat and looked at me. One more thing, ma'am. I'm gonna need your phone. I can't have you calling the police on me, he explained. I didn't say a word, just handed him my phone, my whole body shaking. For what it's worth, I am sorry, he said before driving away into the night. I walked for about half an hour before I managed to flag down a police car. I told him what happened as we drove to the police station to file a report. The officer told me that my description matched that of a man who was wanted for several armed robberies in this and other surrounding towns. It was like he was waiting for somebody to pass by on the road so he could take advantage of their goodwill. I was that unlucky person. It really messed with my mind to have such a polite and friendly person turn on me in the blink of an eye. I've always been someone who tries to help others, but this has made me question my entire worldview. Why should I put myself at risk for someone who may mean to do me harm? That's a decision we all need to make for ourselves. I don't want to give up on the world or anything. It's just something to think about. Stay safe out there, and watch out for each other.